Uh, well, I welcome all of you, and I'm pleased to see that so many people have been able to get through the, the blizzard from last night and this morning. It's actually not so bad, and of course we're tough, right? Uh, we, are, we are central Ohioans who are used to this sort of thing. Uh, I'm Paul Beck, and I'm the chair of the steering committee for the Emeritus Academy, uh, and I want to welcome you to the fifth of our eight talks this year. Uh, we have another one coming up on March the 7th. Charles Klopp is going to talk about language and dialects in Italy, and I hope that all of you will be able to attend that. Uh, I also want to thank the College of Arts and Sciences Digital Media Studio for basically videotaping this lecture and, in fact, all the lectures we've had this year. We are posting those on our website. Uh, they aren't always posted immediately after the lecture, but pretty close to it actually, and so I invite you if there are particular parts of a talk that you want to look at again, uh, or if you haven't been able to attend a particular talk and are interested in that talk, I invite you to take a look at the website and, and, uh, and see the recording there. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Bill Osage. Uh, he's a professor of emeritus since 2013 from the School of Earth Sciences. And he's currently the director of the Orton Geological Museum, still as a labor of love rather than as a paid activity, I understand. Uh, he's trained as a paleontologist, specializing in crinoids, I think they are pronounced, which are, I had to look this up, uh, which are marine animals uh, extant today, but also there are really interesting fossilized remains of them going back millennia, uh, and I believe Bill's going to spend a good deal of time talking about that. Uh, beyond his many books and articles, he's received special recognition as an Ohio State University Distinguished Scholar uh, and as a winner of the Arts and Sciences, College of Arts and Sciences Hatcher Award. He has won teaching and mentorship awards from his school. He is a triple AS fellow. Uh, and also, and I can say this as a, a, somebody who grew up in a neighboring state, he's a Kentucky colonel, which is, is, is quite a nice, a nice honor to have. Uh, well, today he will explore the fossil record from the past, and we are very glad to have him here. Uh, let me introduce Bill. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can people hear me okay? I'm used to shouting in the class, so... Okay, and thank you all for coming. I realize the weather is not uh, most conducive when you, walk, when you woke up this morning to come here, but I appreciate your being here. Um, I'm going to do, try to do three things today. One, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the schism between science and society today. Uh, and I, if, if I get too political, I apologize, but it's hard to say anything without getting into that area a little bit. I also want to say a little bit about how paleontologists do what they do, and then I want to get to the topic here, uh, which is to, to see how we can, uh, paleontologists can contribute to understanding some of the, the problems we're facing in, in the world today. Um, you've probably all seen this. I wish I had this when I was still teaching. This is from CNN. This is an apple. Some people might try to tell you that it's a banana. They might scream banana, banana, banana over and over. They might put banana in all caps. You might even start to believe that this is a banana. But it's not. This is an apple. I love that. You know, when I was teaching, I, I could just put up this slide, you know, that there is an objective reality, and that's what we're teaching here, and you can't ignore that. Um, Okay, so you know, as you know, science and society has several different places where they uh, don't mesh today in many, in many uh, different communities. Uh, it turns out that I'm, I'm biased, of course, and I, I don't have uh, uh, genetically modified foods and the anti-vaxxers, but geology is actually you know, at the center of many of these things, the spherical earth, uh, the age of the earth, evolution, extinction, climate change, water, and if you deny the age of the earth, then you don't have plate tectonics, you don't have continental glaciation. I mean, so the big ideas of the earth, people don't even believe in. Um, you know, we can laugh at some of these things. I like, uh, you know, we, at this particular uh, uh, cartoon, I'll read some of it. It says, uh, uh, what's this all about? F freedom. Freedom from what? The stupid law of gravity, mostly. 
we, and it says, petition to stop science oppression. Uh, we need to end dictatorship of science that won't allow us to float around anywhere we feel like. And this woman says, well, but uh, that doesn't make any sense, but I don't trust those sneaky scientists. And again, she says here, it's time that we make the earth flat again. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Dan, I'll just read this last panel here. It says, uh, you make my brain wish you could crawl out and go back to bed. Repeal the law of physics. You could do that. And he says, please stop. <laughs> um, and so we laugh at this, but I want to point out this. This is from just this past year from the National Center for Science Education. Uh, a news reporter was researching on how teachers navigate sort of how uh, socially controversial topics get, how they deal with them in their classroom. And oops, and, 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 uh, and then I quote, uh, but chillingly, he discovered that it isn't only misinformation about climate change deniers that make its way into the classroom. A student reported a jarring episode where a number of students told him that the earth was flat. Climate change deniers, creationists, flat earthers, never a dull moment at the NCS. Um, you know, I, this is disturbing. Although, you know, when the Ohio retiree associations you, you, um, go to this hotel for their uh, trip, I, I want to sign up, let me know. <laughs> Um, and if you want to learn more about it, you know, you can check out the Flat Earth Society webpage. I mean, it's out there. Uh, it's scary. Um, okay, I, I'm preaching the choir here, but you know, science is, is critical to the American economy and to our, da our, our uh, global competitiveness, and it's critical to the future of America. And, and yet we have these problems where some people, not, maybe, maybe not many, believe the Earth is, is flat, Many don't believe in geologic time, sort of, et cetera. Um, and you know, it's, it's, there is an objective reality. And, uh, what's, and so what, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that. If I, if I, as a paleontologist, am going to worry about trying to contribute all, obviously this part of evolution and extinction is, is where I can uh, make a contribution. Um, and so what I want to do then is to talk about the, the biosphere collapse and recovery uh, from the fossil record. Um, and, and this basically comes from a whole series of studies over the years that my students and, and collaborators elsewhere have, have worked on. Um, but let's first talk about paleontology. I mean, paleontology, uh, you know, we do just look at fossils and go, oh my God. This is the largest dinosaur. Oops. Come on, come back. This is the largest dinosaur. This is the largest dinosaur. These are people for scale. Um, it, my, it boggles your imagination. This is a toe bone of a T-Rex, an actual fossil. Again, if, if this doesn't excite the imagination in you, then I, I, I'm, you're hopeless. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, but, you know, so these are fantastic. But you, you can also sort of marvel at these little the photos, photosynthetic part of the phytoplankton in the ocean. They're called coccolithophorans. They are so small that before you had a scan electron microscope, you couldn't even focus on them. Um, this is, oh geez, this is two microns here. But these fossils are the primary constituent of chalk. So the white cliffs of Dover are almost entirely made out of these things so small you can't see them with a light microscope. Um, and again, it's a fossil. These are Cretaceous in age, the same age as, as, uh, as dinosaurs. Okay, what did, geologists, what did paleontologists and geologists do? Well, you know, uh, yes, indeed, we have a hammer in our hand, we put on boots, and we go out in the field, and we collect fossils. Um, and w but let's contrast this with some of my geochemical friends who, you know, they get some apparatus, and they figure out, you know, what a molecule is, and then they decide they can get a bigger apparatus and then they can figure out what a bigger molecule is, and they throw out all the old data. I'm exaggerating, but you know, get my point. What do paleontologists do? Well, you know, we actually still put on our boots. We have we have nicer vehicles to go collect fossils with, um, but we still just go out and collect fossils. And part of our problem is that simply, you know, a fossil that Edward Orton Sr. collected in 1880 
is equally significant to a fossil that you and I could go out and collect um, in southern Indiana today. That's why we have museums, because we need all those data. Now, again, the fossils that we collect aren't all that, you know, I mean, they're, they're still, they're not sort of fancy machines that make, make the results or anything, but then we've evolved in a way that we actually analyze fossils, so that that's sort of the way, way that's moving. You know, so, for example, this is a, uh, this is a fossil, a new species we described recently uh, from Africa. Um, this had no fossil left. It was just an empty mold inside a rock. And with CT scanning, um, there, with CT scanning, we can get a complete look at something that didn't even exist any longer, really, except just the mold on the outside. Um, uh, these are fossils that are about 340 million years old. Um, and if you stare at this long enough, you can convince yourself, and it is true, that there are three different species here, one in white, one almost in black, and, and this one is sort of a gray. They're on the same slab of rock, subjected to all the same processes of preservation for different colors. It has to be some kind of a signal screaming back at you from the original fossils. And in fact, you know, we were able, a graduate student of mine, we were able to, to, to isolate taxon-specific organic molecules from things that are 340 million years old. So you know, again, the techniques, and I'll show you some of the, some of the mathematical techniques that we use, is all advanced and evolved, uh, but we still go to museums to find these specimens, uh, as well as in the field. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about geology, and so first, geological time. Um, the Earth was formed about 400 and, uh, uh, 4,600 uh, million years ago, 4.6 billion. Most of Earth history is called the Precambrian. Uh, the real fossil record used to began right here, uh, what we call the Phanerozoic, which is divided into the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic, ancient life, middle life, and, and recent life. And, and so I'm, what I'm going to do today is to talk about sort of some of this, this uh, time in here. Um, and I always like to do this to a, uh, to a biology class. You know, I, 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 when I talk about evolution, I say, oh, ex you know, evolution and extinction. Extinction? I mean, who cares? I mean, extinction is natural, right? And everybody's, you know, panics about it. But extinction is a natural part of the history of life on Earth. If things hadn't gone extinct, there wouldn't be room for new things to evolve, et cetera. Okay, so, but, you know, there are times in Earth history where extinction is excessive. And so, uh, you know, we can calculate what we call a background extinction through time. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, the history, the number of genera through time. This is the whole Phanerozoic. So this is the, uh, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. And the ups and downs of the, the number of genera that we, that we know about living in the ocean. And in fact, if we do, uh, uh, we look at this, there are, three, there are five major times when uh, the, uh, the extinction was much greater than the background extinction. And we call these mass extinctions. Now, the one, you, the one that you know the most, of course, is the extinction of the dinosaurs. It happened at the end of the Cretaceous, which, you know, well, it's not the most important one, but it is there. You know, uh, right, uh, oops, that's right, uh, right there. Boy, I didn't get these buttons right there. You know, and this is sort of the iconic, one of the iconic slides I would show to uh, give an example of what happened when that meteorite hit the Earth um, when the, when the dinosaurs then became extinct. Uh, I just found this, this cartoon in uh, the New Yorker recently, which I like better, uh, which is a satisfied meteorite in his trophy room. Um, okay, however, uh, the bad news is that we're undergoing a mass extinction right now. If we look at the organisms that are going extinct today and calculate their extinction and extrapolate that into geologic time, we are now witnessing the greatest mass extinction that has ever occurred on Earth. And, you know, and we're the cause. So it's, it's not a happy, happy thought. Um, and so, you know, so what can we do? How can we contribute to understanding something about mass extinctions? Um, again, uh, you know, Al Gore with this, but the, for other reasons too, both from the standpoint of uh, uh, habitat destruction as well as global warming and all these things are actually uh, causing uh, great mass extinctions today. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a paper from um, 2015, which she talks about the, a safe operating space for humanity. And uh, he, had, he 
comes, the, his group comes up with what they call planetary boundaries that must not be transgressed. And in fact, genetic has, phosphorus is almost there. Uh, some of these don't even know how to calibrate yet. Uh, but again, we are perturbing the Earth system um, much more than, we, than we'd like to. So what can we do about it? Well, we can just watch everything extinct and wring our hands and not worry about it. Uh, or we can do a variety of other things. We can eliminate the primary threats, uh, global warming, pollution, ocean acidification, deforestation. We can protect uh, uh, endangered environments. Um, we can, well, something I never hear much about, but you know, I think we should, what we should do is to protect the refugia, so the endangered organisms are going to go someplace and protect that so that they don't go extinct. But, you know, I don't hear much about that. Uh, we can understand the physiology or the genetic attributes of organisms to help them survive. Uh, E.O. Wilson, a Harvard PhD, has a recent book that he called Half Earth, Our Planet's F Fight for Life, and his, his recommendation was to um, save half of the globe as pristine nature and then we could be okay. Because one of the attitudes in, in, uh, in Washington that comes out of Washington today is, is that we can save a little. The environment will be okay, we can just save a little. Um, probably not. However, we can also study global change and extinctions and formal recovery through deep time. This is not the first extinction. We've witnessed and we can sample extinctions and, and recoveries from extinctions in the fossil record. And so what can we learn from those uh, and, and help to contribute to understanding what's happening today. Um, and just simply a National Research Council uh, report. Uh, we can all find one that supports what we want to do, but uh, only geohistorical data can provide a time perspective sufficiently long to establish the full range of natural variability of complex biological systems and to discriminate natural perturbations in such systems from those induced by or magnified by humans. So if, and if I'm going to do that, I am going to do it with a group of animals that I know the most about, which are called crinoids. Crinoids is the proper British pronunciation, right, right David? Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, crinoids um, are quintessential um, marine organisms. They're, they belong to the phylum Echinodermata, which includes starfish and, uh, and sand dollars. And they also you know, include um, brittle stars and sea urchins, um, et cetera. And then, you know, crinoids are one of those. They're still living today, as Paul said. Uh, there are those that live in shallow water that look like this, um, that don't have a stem. And the closest place that you can go to find those today would be to, to drive down to the Florida Keys or go to the Bahamas. And here, uh, they're living, so here they're sort of nocturnal in, in, the, in the Caribbean today. Jeez. Um, and so these little arms are just arms hanging down from this crevice uh, in, in a... Uh, in a reef in, in uh, San Salvador, uh, they are out, they're out during the day um, in, in the, uh, on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, sort of very prominent organisms, uh, beautiful organisms. If you want a, an analog for crinoids living in the deep, the, in the fossil rock that have a stalk, you need to go down to greater than 100 meters of water depth. And you know, here's a, a pickled live one of these um, right here. Um, and you know, these occur all, all across the globe in deep water um, t today. And you know, here's some in the Straits of Florida. I mean, it's not a dinosaur, but it's still some majestic sort of creature to me, I think. Um, and then, of course, fossils are preserved uh, beautifully as well. I mean, again, just it's one of the crinoids are one of the, sort of the iconic fossils that you f can find, you know, at what on earth and other, d other dealers, uh, if you will. So it, 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 this is the fossil record. Um, that we're looking at, um, and again, I brought in, I brought, if you want to see it, here, here's an example of a, of, a, of a fossil crinoid. Okay, this is the geologic history, the evolutionary history of crinoids. Again, starting, um, and this is the, the, the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, and you can see uh, that they had this rapid rise throughout this time. Yeah, this is the one, this is the biggest great mass extinction at the end of the Paleozoic, you can see that. And crinoids recovered, and there are many that are uh, still that are still living today. Uh, we divide this into three what we call a crinoid evolutionary faunas in the Paleozoic. 
early, middle, and late. Um, you know, to you, they'd all look like crinoids, I'm sure. But to me, uh, this is analogous to, say, when land animals were dominated by amphibians, and then they changed to reptiles in the Mesozoic, and then they changed to mammals. I mean, they're that fundamental different shifts in the faunas. And so there's a total reorganization of the faunas that, that took place uh, during these times. And uh, that's what I want to examine. You know, what really turned over these whole forms? What made them change so much? Can we try to, can we try to understand that? Um, again, on our geological time scale, I'm going to talk mostly today uh, about a transition that occurs at the Ordovician Silurian boundary, this right here. So it's about 440, 450 million years ago. And I'll very briefly talk about one in the Carboniferous, it's 340 million years ago. Okay, and again, what I want to do is to see if I can find any hint of sort of what the drivers are, any commonalities that we can find uh, that could try to explain why these changes uh, took place. Okay, um, you know, one of the reasons why we haven't understood those until recently is because this Ordovician Silurian boundary, there just weren't many fossils known. So, you know, there's just this big gap in our knowledge. So, you know, one of my research objectives has been to go out and fill that gap. And one of the places where I worked on that is a place called Anticosti Island, sitting out here in the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. It's probably the most remote place in eastern North America. It doesn't show up in any road maps because they always, they're square and it always gets left out. Um, uh, this is a, you know, a, a fascinating um, island in, in many respects. It, uh, um, it's, it's, part, it's, it's part of Quebec. Um, it has, you know, beautiful, scene, uh, beautiful uh, coastline exposures that are full of fossils, uh, bedrock streams. The Eastern two-thirds of the island is basically a virgin spruce forest. Unfortunately, the Quebec government is trying to boost tourism there. I'd rather it was just left there for me to be there, but yeah, that, that's not going to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, and so this is the booming metropolis of, uh, of Port Meunier uh, in An Anacosti. And yes, you know, we get our boots on, we get a hammer, and we get in the vehicle, and we take, you know, get out food, fill a truck full of food and bring it back full of fossils and, and then, you know, then we're happy. And head on down the main, the main road of the island. There's about three miles of paved road on this island. And, uh, you know, then you get off on the secondary roads. And, and you're, you know, basically, you know, you know, you're just all on your own. You have to bring your own spare tires. You have to cut down trees that fall across the roads, et cetera. I mean, so just, you know, real fundamental. Uh, field, field work that is, is still a very, very important part of geology. Um, and then you sort of sleep wherever you can sleep. Um, I've spent five field seasons there, and, uh, um, and you know, the, the fruits of that, you know, are tremendous. It's a very fossiliferous place. Um, and, you know, so here's a trilobite. Uh, these are a variety of, of, of brachiopods. Um, these little circles are actually crinoid stems. Um, here's an example of some snails. Uh, and you know, there's, there, I, uh, uh, there have been dozens of monographs written on this because it's such a unique time and place to fill in this gap that we didn't know about. Uh, here's a starfish. And of course, what I'm interested in are, are crinoids. There's one. I could talk about these for a long time, and that probably wouldn't go over real big. Um, but so you know, this is the, what we call the stratigraphic section. This is the sequence of rocks and all the names that they're given. Um, and this is then a map showing the distribution of those um, across the island. We're interested in the Ordovician Silurian boundary, which is right here. So it, that's on this, the south side of this green unit that's mapped across here. Um, and you know, we collected all the way through this, this whole section. This is effectively the this, this section with most places in the world is nothing. Um, it's to get a place you can actually sample uh, this uh, in, in sort of regular oceanic uh, shelly, shelly faunas. Uh, this is actually the westernmost, one of the westernmost points of the island, and uh, this shows the Ordovician Silurian boundary. There's a man there for scale, and just this wavy line right in here is an approximate at that, at that border. These are little reefs that are right there, and then it was filled in afterwards with, with other, other organisms. And the, as you go from 
you know, from here, work your way up the rocks to here, to here, and all of a sudden the, the organisms that live in the Ordovician are gone. And there are new organisms that then are present in the rocks above that. Um, again, uh, one, one reason is to, you know, why we went there, um, just to give you an idea here in Ohio, this is uh, uh, what the Appalachian Highway, um, um, the Bert, uh, at Highway 32 going across southern Ohio, and that Ordovician slurrian boundary is right there between these, uh, that change in slope. Uh, but there's a gap here, which we call that an unconformity. So an unconformity is time that's not represented by fossils. So it's missing time. And uh, across the island, where we have nothing, they have over 200 meters of rock. And this other gap in here, they have another 50 meters of rock. That's why, you know, we spend the time to go to a place like Anacostia. Okay, and then just to give you an idea again of what we do, when I, when I started out, there were six species of crinoids known from Anacostia Island. There are now 49 species in 39 genera, 18, are new, genera, 18 new genera, and 41 new species. Again, this was a physical place as well as a time where we knew nothing before and stuff was just brand new. But that's what we need in order to, you know, to, to work on this larger problem. Okay, and so, you know, with that information then added into a total data set for the whole globe of crinoids through this interval, uh, the interval being the Ordovician to the Silurian, the Ordovician Silurian boundary is right in here. You plot all this up. Uh, this is the number of genera uh, and how that changes through time. And you can look at this and say, well, you know, this could be telling us two things. It could be telling us that diversity, number of organisms going up and down and up and down, you know, or, you know, it, it could just be a variation of the line, so a you know, trend. You know, so we don't know what that is. And, you know, in order to solve that, uh, you know, there are various uh, uh, mathematical techniques, uh, resampling statistics, so-called. Now, paleontologists can't run an experiment. We can't just make a design an experiment and go out and collect data. We just get whatever we can get, whatever the outcrop gives us, and figure out what it means and how good it is. And how is it different from random, are the patterns we see different from random. And so what this is is simply a different, two different ways in which we sort of re did resampling statistics, things like bootstrapping, and uh, they both give the same result. And there's this rapid rise in the early part of the Ordovician and then the, the, the number of organisms um, leveled off, and then there was a statistically significant extinction event that took place, and then eventually around, it rebounded back. So there really was a mass extinction, an extinction beyond uh, an extinction that we can identify. Um, and so what does this sort of correlate with? Well, first of all, it's not the end of the Ordovician, but it's the time before that which we call the, it's the end of the Cadian. And what happened at the end of the Cadian was that there was a global uh, glacial uh, epoch that happened at that time. Here are, um, here is a, pole, a South Pole view. Um, we're over here, Anticosti is right there. Um, and uh, so continent so-called Gondwana is sitting down here at the South Pole. Um, the Iapetus Ocean, which I'll come back to later, is sitting right in here. And these are the Baltica, Scandinavia's there. Uh, on this little uh, sl sliver here is where m much of the British Isles are, um, et cetera. Um, from a, from a uh, uh, an equatorial view, again, there was ice at the bottom, and Laurentia was sitting right here. Um, so, and there are other different proxies we can make to sort of look at, see whether there's a glaciation or not. Um, so this is a, uh, a diagram from a paper we did on looking at uh, delta carbon-13 for carb carbonate and organic carbon. And as you go up the Anticosti section, it just sort of wiggles back and forth, and you get right up to here, and boom, there's this big shift. And you know, that, that shift is indicative of a glaciation. So there's a lot of different ways you can figure that out. You can find glacial sediments in South America at this point, place. You can find glacial grooves in Morocco at this time in Earth history. Lots of different kinds of evidence that there actually was a glaciation at this time. Um, and so there's two things that were going on. There was global cooling and 
there was a habitat destruction that was going on at this time. Two things, global, global climate change and habitat destruction. Um, what am I talking about with uh, habitat destruction? I'll come back to this. Um, there was a shallow ocean up until this point, and then you know, we're worried about glaciers melting and sea level rising, but where glaciers form, sea level falls, and the ocean you know, moved away from this part of the country. Um, this, all these habitats were destroyed for you know, 10, 15 million years, and, th and then it came back. So big habitat destruction, as well as global cooling. And there's other things that we can do to look at this as well. Something we call the, li the lily put effect. Um, uh, so that it turns out that at many big extinctions, the organisms that survive are very small. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. But they're miniaturized, and then times get good again, and then, then they come to full size later on. And so you know, here is a little slab of crinoids. These are millimeter in size. You can't even see them. They're so small on, on that slab. Um, and here's some, again, a millimeter scale, you know, really pretty small specimens. And just quickly, if you look at uh, an estimate that we did of the mean body volume of organisms, uh, going from oldest here to younger to younger, younger to younger, younger, the mass extinction is here. Um, right here, there's a, a, a th the volume, but the body volume, maximum body volume is decreased by, um, you know, on the order of uh, a, a third or more. It stays very low and then eventually it recovers, uh, kind of parallel to that curve of, of faunal recovery that, we, that I showed you. Um, another kind of a goofy way to look at this is that uh, um, we can look at extinction rates of organisms and, and, uh, and, and, uh, um, and recovery rates, evolutionary rates, um, but so, uh, some people have also tried to quantify the rock record, like how many different kinds of rock and strata are there, and make this into sort of a numerical estimate of what, what the world is like. So we, if that is true, then we, can, then we can look at both extinction rate and evolutionary rate of the strata, of the environments that are there. And if you look, if you compare the extinction rates of strata to the fossils that we looked at, it turns out that they're totally in lockstep that as environments come and go, the, the species come and go. And however, if you look at the recovery rates or the, the origination rates, they're out of step. So basically, I mean, this means that as the environments disappear, organisms go extinct, the environments come back, and evolution takes millions of years to recover. It doesn't just happen overnight, you know, which is not, again, so some, not, not a happy thought. Okay, so the bad news is that uh, Extinction um, is rapid, it's indiscriminate, and the worst news is that it takes several million years for either at a, glo a global level or a local level for, um, for the diversity to, to, to recover, for the lily put reversal to happen, and we've even done some things where we looked at what we call morphological disparity, which is just the different kinds of morphologies there are and, and the diversity of morphologies. And again, it takes millions of years for that, to, that space of morphology to be refilled again. So, and so, you know, uh, not, not a happy, uh, not a happy uh, situation. Um, very quickly, I want to look at this interval. I could talk, give a whole talk on this, uh, this, uh, this changeover from the middle to the late uh, Paleozoic. So when these beautiful crinoids disappeared. Um, and uh, two things were happening there. I'll just summarize. One is habitat destruction, again. Um, basically, this middle part of the U.S. where we are was all one big carbonate platform. And by that, I mean it was like the Bahamas. However, when the Iapetus Ocean closed, uh, North America collided with other continental areas, and that's when we had the, the evolution of the, Rocky Mount, of the Appalachian Mountains. And then these were shedding sediments over this carbonate platform. So you can imagine what would happen if you move the Mississippi River Delta and laid it right over the Bahamas. I mean, it would destroy the habitat. Actually, it would be more like taking um, the, the, uh, the rivers coming off of, of the Himalayas in the Indian subcontinent <laughs> and dumping them, because these were high mountains at that point. Um, and so you know, they would have a habitat destruction. And then you know, we also had a major change in predators that took place. So we went from 
fish that just kind of nibbled at, at, at their prey, the crunchers. And so there's a major change in predators as well as a habitat, a major destruction of habitats that happened at, at this time. And here's just an example. This is a fish from, uh, from Montana, uh, one of the crunchers. Um, and uh, you know, here's, it's got this, you can see the fins here, the tail fin there. And it's got these huge teeth that are, still, that are sitting there. I mean, that was a fairly new innovation at, at that point. OK, so for both of these examples, the Ordovician Silurian boundary and the Middle Mississippian boundary, there were two things that were going on. One, habitat destruction, and then something else. In one case, it was a, it was a, a, a climate change, and the other was a major change in predators. And those two things together, I, I you know, would tell my students that a mass extinction is like a bad hair day. I mean, everything's going wrong at once. And you finally just get to a tipping point and extinctions sort of cascade af after that. Um, and so, what does that tell us about today? I hate, I always hate to end on a bad note. <laughs> what are we doing to the globe today? We are rapidly destroying habitat. We are undergoing a man-made major episode of climate change, in this case warming. And although a little bit more um, obtuse, but the world's most significant predator is also attacking the biosphere. That's us. So, you know, things don't look very good. I mean, so rather than being just, a, you know, a real downer, I mean, I would say that we should... Not, we should take this as a call to action. I mean, we do need to not destroy habitats. We need to, to cut back the chain, and we need to be good stewards of our Earth. And, and so, you know, the, the fossil record tells us that if we don't, if we just continue like we're doing, things are not going to, you know, not be very good for future generations. It doesn't matter for us, you know, but for our grandkids, it probably will matter for our grandkids. And so, um, you know, so uh, these planetary boundaries, we need to keep them from being transgressed as, as much as possible. And, you know, so I, I've always been a, a Winston Churchill fan, and uh, this is a good, a, a good advertisement for geology and paleontology. The farther backward you look, the farther forward you can see. Because extinction is forever. Now, if you haven't fallen asleep yet, you'll say, but wait, 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 wait. We're now getting DNA from extinct organisms, and we're going to bring them back. Well, two things about that. First, you know, just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. And that's way above my pay grade to make that decision. But despite the fact that people say that we're going to bring back the mammoth or the mastodon, or in this case, the passenger pigeon, uh, from everything I've read, you know, we're really not. We're going to get some of their DNA and hybridize it with something that's close to it today. And we're going to get some hybrid. And we're going to get something, you know, its habitat has already been destroyed. We're going to make, bring something back that doesn't belong here anymore. I mean, it did belong here, but it doesn't anymore. So whether it should be done or not is another story. But um, be that as it may, um, I guess if I have one, one message, it would be, uh, you know, wherever you can, be a good steward of Earth. We only have one, and we need to take care of it. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yes? When you have a mass extinction, is it just measured in terms of the diversity of species and so on, or also you know, volume of living things? I'm wondering if when you have a mass extinction, if somebody gets lucky and you end up with 10 zillion jellyfish or something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, no, it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, the way that we typically do it is simply by the number of organisms that are going extinct. That's how you sort of calibrate it. Now, what happens oftentimes is what we have, we call it a disaster fauna, because after, of those things that do come back, they come back into a largely empty biosphere, or relatively speaking, and so there can be these big blooms of things that occur after that. Um, so that in that case, the biomass recovers more quickly, the overall biomass recovers more quickly than the overall genetic diversity of, of life.
Yeah. Yes. So when you um, get the remains of a uh, fairly small number, I'm assuming, of <coughs> organisms, um, how do you determine uh, whether these are different species or variations within a species? How do you define speciation for that? Is it just on morphological grounds? Or you're not getting DNA. No, it's, it's just on morphology. And, you know, up until, for the sake of argument, a decade and a half ago, that's how every biologist did it the same way. I mean, as, you know, and, I mean, and so we, we typically sort of, you know, use a, a, a classic biological species definition of it's a reproducing population of organisms that has a similar sort of morphology. And, uh, and you know, this is one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the challenges we have in, in, in paleontology, and at least in my field, um, not only and find new uh, areas from new times we don't have represented, but to look at uh, 150 years worth of work that was done by people in the 1800s who basically, you know, got pieces by the number of species they could name. They had no idea what intraspecific variation was. And so we still need to resample and look at all these collections and, and actually try to get our arms around what seemed to be sort of natural variability of, of morpho morphological change versus things that, 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 that are significantly different. Yeah, and you know, so there's, yeah, so we, we just, we just work. You guys argue amongst yourself about whether this is an interspecies variation or a um, You know, a little, a little bit, not as much as you would think, but of course we do, of course we do. Uh, you know, we can even identify hybrids in, in, in the fossil record. I mean, we can, we can do a lot. I mean, it's sort of the, you know, I think that at least in my field, we don't argue too much about the systematics that people do, but we argue about how you put it together into an evolutionary phylogeny, and, and that, that, that gets kind of ugly sometimes, but yeah. But sure, the different people, I mean, the one, the one thing is that, you know, science is done by people, so all the foibles of people are just rife throughout science, so yeah, you get all that. Yes. Well, uh, in relation to the extinction and the longevity of the species, is there any correlation? No. The, 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 uh, the question is, is uh, the, uh, the, the, does the longevity of a species correlate with its ability to survive a mass extinction? And, you know, probably not. The, uh, from what we can tell, the, the longevity of a species is correlated with how widespread it was when it was alive. And then, you know, and then that would actually, uh, it would, uh, that would give you, if you're more widespread when you're alive, you have a, a better chance to survive an extinction. But, but, but by and large, people have not really, um, people not, have not demonstrated that in terms of the longevity of species and their potential for survival of an extinction. I had two things I wanted to ask. One, when, when did chlorophyll first appear? Do we know? Does a fossil record give us any indication? Because the energy from the big sun is out there. Yeah, well, uh, somebody helped me out here like 1.9 billion years ago. 2.5 is when the two point diamonds. Yeah, so two, yeah. Yeah, you know, we, we basically, uh, people can actually look at Precambrian microfossils and, you know, things that are as, as old as like, uh, you know, 4.2 billion years old and identify them as, as mostly pro, uh, uh, you know, bacteria and cyanobacteria. And then as you look sequentially through the record, then we get, uh, then we get eukaryotes and we get green algae and then animals eventually and then multicellular and then, you know, I mean, there's this, this full uh, progression um, of, um, of life that we see unfolding the way that it should. I mean, this is one thing that I always say to my students in, in a class, is I said evolution is a very easy uh, theory to disprove. Along the line, sorry, along the lines oh. of chlorophyll, uh, mainly we were talking about fossil records for animals. Yes. Is there relationships between the extinctions, between uh, plant life, early plants and the early animal fossils that we're discussing because there is a fossil record for plants. Um, 
probably not as much as you would think. Okay, and you know the reason for being. I mean, one of the, give you an example of a reason for that. Uh, when the dinosaurs went extinct, the dinosaurs died out, and they couldn't. Okay, but the, the angiosperms are already there, had seeds that were lying around, and they could sprout again when things got good. So that the the mode of reproduction of plants versus animals. Uh, in many cases, would would allow the animals to be a little bit more extinction resistant. But I'll go back to that point. And evolution is a very easy idea to disprove. Darwin came up with this theory uh, that we didn't know much about the fossil record at that point, and now we do. And in fact, the fossil record unfolds as predicted, you know, through evolutionary theory. And then once again, we do genomics. And we could disprove, we could disprove evolution if, if different organisms that we think are close together, from an evolutionary standpoint, are, are very far genetically. And it turns out they're very close. You know, so there are several easy ways to disprove evolution, and no one has actually. I mean, the tests that we can run don't you know, demonstrate that it is, in fact, the best explanation of what we have. Any other questions? Yes. There is none. Okay. So where do you go from there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, you know, I have students that memorize what I tell them, but they don't believe a word of it. And, you know, I, I don't know how I can actually do anything different. Uh, you know, I don't know what to do beyond that. Uh, um, I, I mean, I, I, I still have a vivid memory over in 110 Norton Hall. Uh, lecture that I talked about evolution, uh, just to introduce the topic as to, student raised his hand and said, is evolution a theory or a fact? And I said, it's a fact. And he crossed his arms and stared at me for the rest of the semester. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't know, I know what you, all you can do is, is try to um, tell people, you know, what's going on. I mean, I, I understand, I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the problems with with evolution education is that the easiest way to handle this in the K through 12 is not to talk about it. So the first, the first time that students will oftentimes even hear a, a scientist talk about it is in their intro biology or in, intro geology course. And you know, what I do, what I did, I don't do it anymore, was you know, I'd have a first, the first lecture on evolution would be to discuss the evolution creationism schism. And you know, basically point out how all these arguments are just total nonsense that are being put forth. Unless, unless there's a, a literal interpretation of the Bible. Then if, if that's your whole frame of reference, then I can't, I can't argue with that, okay? And then I say, now the rest of this course, I'm going to talk about science. <laughs> and you can come to my class anytime you want to, but I'm not going to talk any more about creationism and challenging evolution because that's not science and that's what I, not what I'm paid to teach you people. And very few of them ever come to talk to you. I, I think students have gotten better lately than they used to be. Yeah. Don't you think that there has been confusion um, that has been added by a misunderstanding of what the word evolution means? Um, as originally introduced, it was like a pole. You know, one thing came from another thing, came from another thing. And in truth, evolution comes up like a field effect. It comes up all over. And some species win, some species lose, and it moves ahead. And I think when students say, oh, I reject that, what are they rejecting? Do they really understand um, the difficulty in the number of fossils, particularly of large animals that have been found? Uh, do they understand that uh, over time there is a whole field effect? Or are they thinking back to those early diagrams um, where the monkey led to a person, et cetera, yeah. which is an incorrect um, yeah. Display well, or interpretation yeah. of what evolution means. Well, I'd say they, they come to the classroom with all of the above. Yeah, that you know, and what you what you try to do is to I've enlighten them. Very few students understand that, say, with the hominids, you know, the human-like thing, they came up all over the world in different places, far distances from each other, and that the challenge has been 
the number of, <coughs> of fossil discoveries. And as more fossil discoveries are added, it's clear that it didn't come up like a single chain. It came up as multiple uh, competitive events, some of which won, some of which lost, some of which moved, and that occurred over an incredible period of time. Yeah. So I, I think evolution is taught incorrectly, that young people learn the wrong associations with it. And if we had an eraser, it would be nice to erase all of that <laughs> <laughs> and replace yeah. it with newer concepts based on newer observations. Well, I think that's what we try to do in introductory geology and biology courses, is try to br bring together a, you know, a, a, an explanation that is actually a accurate and 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 b will hopefully right, get them to explain them. Missing pieces because there are no associated fossils. You're in the whole scheme of things. Yeah, well, that's that's true. Although, again, you know, if you go look for them, you can oftentimes find them. You know, for example, people we've been told forever that uh, that whales, which are mammals, evolved from some undulate, you know, organism, and they migrated back into water. And so, you know, there's a group from from Michigan who went out and found the right age rocks, the right type of environments, and they went and found a whale with legs. I mean, those fossils are there. Right. You just have to. Yeah, well, those now are the... Where the, did it fit in the evolution, this broad yeah. evolution? Yeah, yeah interestingly enough, that fish doesn't lead toward, toward land animals. But yes, you're right. The lobefin fish, coelacanths, uh, you know, are still, uh, you know, it's, it's a very ancient fish that's still alive, which has a great story in itself. A, a paleontologist walked by a fish market in Africa and saw one for sale at a fish market, and he about lost it. And then it took them a while to find out where, they, where it actually came from. Any other questions? Yeah. Just a curiosity. What time in your life you decided to go this route of research? Uh, uh, well, to be honest with you, um, when I was in high school, all I cared about was where the next basketball or football game was. <laughs> But I had, a, I had a grandfather who, who in his retirement, collected rocks. And, you know, interestingly enough, uh, one of the rocks that he polished had crinoid stems in it. And we figured out what those were, et cetera. Um, and I was trying to debate between biology and geology when I went to <coughs> undergraduate school at the University of Illinois. And I picked geology. But as you can see, I'm still, I'm still in the middle trying to figure out which one of those I'm in. Um, and uh, the first geology class that I took, uh, you know, one of the topics there was what we call glacial geomorphology. That would be the landscapes that are left over after glaciers retreat. You know, and I grew up in the middle of the bottom of a lake bed in Illinois in a cornfield, you know, where Columbus is topographically rich compared to where I grew up. But all of a sudden, this completely bland landscape could be interpreted. You could understand the earth. And I was sold, you know, into geology there. And then, and then it turns out there's some graduate students working on crinoids in Illinois, and, and that was it. How were your teachers? Pardon? How were your professors did, did, the topic in the subject? Did they influence, if any? Oh, well, there's no question about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, all, we all have a series of mentors. Thank you. And, and I went to graduate school to work on the best person in the world on crinoids, you know, so that's what I went to go to graduate school for. Yeah, yeah Paul. And why have crinoids survived over all these years, whereas other species have, have not? Well, they've survived in the deep ocean. Mm -hmm. They've survived in a place where predators are fairly uh, minimal. They, they wouldn't survive in shallow water. Mm -hmm. Uh, the stalked ones wouldn't, and you know, and many of the crinoids that are uh, um, that are in shallow water today are nocturnal. So mm -hmm. fish are visual predators, and uh, so they hide during the day and come out and feed at night. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, uh, the the the, uh, the the predation pressure on a reef is incredible. Um, I was scuba diving once, 
with students in the Bahamas, and I had a, a brittle star, which is a starfish with skinny, and I, you know, I like to play with these things, and so I was dropping them, and showing us to a student, and a fish came by and <laughs> took it. I just had three arms in my hand. And predation pressure, if you just sit on, at a mm. reef and listen, you can hear the fish crunching mm. on mm. the reef. The predation pressure is intense. In the deep sea, there's less, and th th that's the reason uh, people have suggested they've actually, I didn't do this work, but have shown that as, as predators increased, crinoids went to deep water. Hmm. So that's probably why they're still around today. And the, and this, this, this kind that's you know, really easy to eat, just sitting out there on a, on a stalk. Okay, thank you very much.